Now, I would now like to hand the conference over to Ankit from Biocon Investors Relations. Thank you, and over to you, Ankit. Thank you, Melvin. Good morning, everyone. I hope you are fine and in good health. I am Ankit from Biocon Investor Relations team, and I welcome you all to the earnings call for the quarter. To discuss the company's performance and outlook today, we have with us the Biocon leadership comprising Dr. Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, our executive chairperson, and other senior management colleagues. I want to take this opportunity to remind you about the safe harbor statement. Today's discussions may be forward-looking in nature based on management's current beliefs and expectations. It must be viewed in concurrence with the risks that our business faces and that could cause our future results, performance or achievements to differ significantly from what is expressed or implied by such forward-looking statements. At the end of this Zoom call, if you need any further clarifications, you can get in touch with us. Now, I would like to turn the call over to Dr. Kiran Mazumdar, sir. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Ankit. Uh, good morning, everyone. I welcome you to uh, the earnings call for Biocon for the fourth quarter and for the full year fiscal 2021. I would like to start on a note of hopeful optimism that we will overcome this devastating second wave of COVID-19 sooner than later through mass vaccination. I wish you and your families good health and safety. The center's announcement that all Indians above the age of 18 will become eligible for vaccination starting May 1st will enable corporate India to vaccinate their employees and immediate family members, which will certainly help us to build the much needed vaccine induced immunity against hospitalization. Biocon is also at the forefront of this fight against COVID-19 our subsidiary Syngene is an accredited vaccination center and we are offering our vaccination services to all companies operating in the electronic city area. The Biocon group is also catering to the countrywide demand for Remdesivir, Itolizumab and Cytosol. Meanwhile, we have taken significant precautions and measures to ensure that our employees continue to work in a safe environment and wherever possible work remotely. Uh, we continue to assess the situation and operate as per government guidelines as they evolve in different regions. This second wave has once again introduced uncertainties in our business operations as well as supply chain logistics However, we will do everything to serve our patients and customers in every possible way, despite all these challenges. Now, let me discuss with you the key developments of the quarter. Let me start with some management updates. Shreya Stambe, former Chief Operating Officer at Biocon Biologics, has been promoted to Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the company effective March 1st, 2021. Shreyas has been with the company for over 20 years in operational and strategic leadership roles. He has large, diverse teams at manufacturing, quality, R&D, and projects and engineering during his tenure within the Biocon group. Biocon Biologics also appointed Sushil Umesh as Chief Commercial Officer, Emerging Markets. Sushil has over 30 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry working in India, France, and Sub-Saharan Africa for leading global pharma companies. With Dr. Arun Chandavarkar taking over as the managing director of Biocon Biologics, Shreyas Tambe as the deputy CEO, and Sushil as the CCO Emerging Markets, I believe we now have a strong leadership team to drive the future growth of our biosimilars business and return the company to its high growth trajectory soon. I would also uh, like to uh, announce the appointment of Indranil Sen as the CFO with immediate effect, uh, concurrent with Anupam Jindal, uh, who has stepped down from the position of CFO at Biocon Limited for personal reasons. Indranil uh, was earlier the Vice President of Finance at Biocon and 
has uh, since 2014 and has performed various key leadership roles within the finance department now coming to key highlights of the quarter biocon biologics uh, mark, uh, received marketing authorization approval from the european commission for both biosimilar bevacizumab and biosimilar insulin aspart this is a very important development these are products which we have co-developed with uh, our partners viatris and we expect to launch these products uh, in the near future as far as our generics business is concerned we received us fda approval for everolimus generic efinitor an immunosuppressant indicated to prevent rejection of organ transplants and used to treat renal cell cancer and other tumors we also entered into a partnership with libs pharmaceutica a leading pharmaceuticals company in brazil to develop and commercialize our portfolio of generic drugs in brazil which as you know is a very large market and ha has the world sixth most is the sixth most populous country in in globally our research services business syngene crossed a significant milestone with the extension of its collaboration with bms until 2030 the new agreement includes an expansion across the breadth of drug discovery research and a 40% increase in the number of scientists and an additional 50000 square feet of dedicated laboratory space i will now present the key financial highlights starting with the quarter and followed by the full year coming to Fisc financial highlights for Q4 fiscal 21 the fourth quarter delivered a year on year growth wherein revenues increased by 26% from 1621 crores last fiscal to uh, to 2044 crores for this quarter revenue from operations stood at 1839 crores up 18% driven by healthy growth of 53% from biosimilars research services grew at 8% whilst generics reported a growth of 3% we recorded gross r&d spends of 136 crores for the quarter which corresponds to 12% of revenues ex syngen of this 126 127 crores is expended in the pnl as r&d expenses while the balance has been capitalized the increase in r&d expenses accounts for higher spending in novel biologics biosimilars and generics we also booked a forex forex gain of a gain of 7 crores this quarter but this compares to a gain of 35 crores last year for the corresponding period EBITDA for the quarter is 641 crores compared to 382 crores for the same period in the previous financial year and EBITDA margins for the quarter stood at 31% against 24% in Q4 FY20 net profit for the quarter is 257 crores during the current quarter Biocon ceded control over the board of directors and operations of Bicara Therapeutics Inc to enable it to operate independently under a US based leadership team and raise funds to advance its development programs as a result of this chain uh, Bicara was classified as an associate from a subsidiary under IND AS consequently the investment in bicara was fair valued resulting in a gain of 160 crores which is reported under other income for the quarter adjusting for Bio bicara's fair valuation gain our ebitda during the quarter was 481 crores reflecting an ebitda margin of 26% net profit from continuing operations excluding the exceptional expense was at 97 crores which is down from last year's 132 crores core margins however which is ex, uh, which is ebitda margin net of licensing forex and r&d stood at 32%
During fiscal year FY21, I would now like to come to the full year financials. Total consolidated revenues grew to 7,360 crores, up 14% compared to 6,462 crores last year. Revenue from operations was 7,106 crores, up 13%. Biosimilars reported a 21% growth from 2,315 to 2,800 crores this fiscal, followed by research services, which delivered 9% growth to report 2,184 crores in revenues. The generics business grew 6% year on year basis, reporting revenues of 2,336 crores. We incurred a gross R&D spend of 627 crores during the year, corresponding to 13% of revenues excluding Sinjin. Of this, 553 crores is reported in the PNL as R&D expenses, while the balance has been capitalized. The capitalized amounts relate to biosimilar development expenses. For the full year, we booked a Forex loss of 9 crores compared to a gain of 65 crores last fiscal. EBITDA grew at 8% for the year, 1,907 crores, and EBITDA margins at 26% for FY21, down from 27% last fiscal. Net profit stood at 754 crores. Adjusting for Baikara's fair valuation gain, our EBITDA for the full year was 1,747 crores, reflecting a margin of 24%. Core margin stood at 32%, down from 33% last year. And net profit from continuing operations, excluding the exceptional expense, net of taxes was 594 crores, down from 789 crores last fiscal. Coming to the review of our business segments, performance for the fourth quarter and full year, let me start with generics. Our generic segment reported growth during modest growth during the quarter on account of headwinds we encountered by way of pricing pressure on both APIs and formulations. Travel restrictions that delayed regulatory approvals also uh, denied us from certain growth opportunities and relatively subdued API revenues as well as formulation launches. The segment reported quarterly revenues of 578 crores, a 3% growth over the corresponding period last fiscal. The quarter's PBT stood at 73 crores versus 71 crores. PBT margins were at 13% versus 13% uh, in, uh, in Q4 FY20. On a full year basis, our revenues grew by 6% to 2336 crores with a profit before tax of 13%, supported by a double digit growth in generic formulations and a modest single digit growth in APIs. As we indicated in the previous quarter, revenues for our API business in the second half of the fiscal were relatively subdued compared to the first half attributable to stockpiling by customers who were anticipating COVID-related supply disruptions. This, of course, led to high demand for APIs in H1. Our revenues for the formulation business were impacted by the absence of new product launches due to delays in the inspection of our facilities, as I mentioned earlier. We have also witnessed pr pricing pressure for some of our critical products. And to mitigate the impact of pricing pressure, we continue to take, uh, undertake several initiatives in cost improvement and optimize our systems and processes to drive operational excellence. We received four drug master file approvals for our products in the US, EU, and most of the world markets during the quarter. While the travel restrictions have impacted new market entries of APIs, we have been working relentlessly to expedite geographical expansion. 10 DMFs were filed in a key most of the world markets. After, after some initial COVID-related delays, the construction of our Greenfield immunosuppressant plant at Vishakapatnam has uh, started returning to normalcy. However, we have to watch the progress based on the second wave. 
while we expect the facility to be commissioned in CY calendar year 2022, as I mentioned earlier, we must uh, be uh, uh, aware of potential disruptions that could happen from the second wave of this pandemic. In our formulations business, our key statin products continue to retain mid to high teens market share in the US. Our first immunosuppressant formulation, Tacrolimus, launched in Q3 FY21, has started to gain market share. We also received US FDA approval for Everolimus, which is generic Efenito. Uh, and this is an immunosuppressant indicated to prevent organ transplant rejection. It is also used to treat renal cell cancer and other tumors. This is a vertically integrated product which further fortifies our global positioning in immunosuppressants. We expect to launch this product in FY22. We continue to build on our generic formulations portfolio by filing abbreviated new drug application for vertically integrated products in the US, in addition to market authorization applications and dossiers in Europe and most of the world markets. The expansion of our generic formulations business outside the US remains a key area of focus. Our partnership with Libs Pharmaceutica in Brazil was a highlight this quarter. In another crucial progress towards certificate, uh, uh, towards uh, establishing a strong presence beyond US, we received a GMP compliant certificate from MHRA UK for our formulation manufacturing facility located at Biocon Park in Bengaluru. Overall, the generics business con continues to be in an investment mode. We remain focused on our strategic priorities and will continue to deploy capital for creating capacity and adding new products through our R&D efforts. As we work towards strengthening our generics business, we expect this segment to de demonstrate modest growth in FY22 and strong uptick in FY23 onwards. Coming to novel molecules, our novel assets continue to be driven by our inherent capabilities and external collaborations. Equilium, our US partner, reported encouraging developments on the clinical advancement of Itolizumab, a first-in-class anti-CD6 monoclonal antibody. Equilium remains excited about e Itolizumab's therapeutic use in acute versus graft versus host disease, lupus and lupus nephritis, and uncontrolled asthma. While COVID delayed clinical studies in 2020, we are awaiting clinical data from all their studies in calendar year 2021. Itolizumab was also launched in India for treatment of COVID-19 under emergency use. We will have the first cut data on the ongoing phase four studies shortly, which will further validate the potential of etolizumab in effective ARDS treatment. The demand, as you must have seen for etolizumab, is far exceeding our ability to supply during the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we expect to catch up with uh, the demand uh, sometime in mid-June. Our COVID portfolio comprising Remdesivir under a voluntary license from Gilead, Cytosob and Itolizumab continues to serve COVID-19 patients in the, wake of a of, in the wake of this second wave. Now coming to biosimilars. Biocon Biologics has recorded revenues of 664 crores in this quarter, a year-on-year -year growth of 53%. EBITDA margins were at 25% with absolute EBITDA growth of 81% year-on-year growth. And however, I must uh, you know, point you to the fact that last fiscal, uh, the quarter was a, an exceptionally low quarter. We have uh, seen a sequential decline of 14% uh, EBITDA I'm sorry, 14% revenue growth decline and a 22% sequential decline in profit in EBITDA growth. 
So I would like to now say that profit before tax stands at 68 crores. Move, moving on to the full year performance, Biocon Biologics recorded revenues of 2,800 crores, representing a year-on-year -year growth of 21%. EBITDA margins was at 27% versus the 33% in fiscal year 2020. Net R&D costs increased from 178 crores in FY20 to 284 crores in FY21. This reflects the good progress we are making on several of our programs. Profit before tax therefore stands at 365 crores compared to 428 crores in FY20. I would again like to emphasize the fact that R&D investments are critical to future growth. And we believe that this is an investment uh, that needs to be looked at very differently compared to other expenditure. Over the last year, we have seen a slight uptick for Fulfiller in the US and steady growth for Ogivri. Despite competition, these products have shown resilient performance. We had launched assembly in the US in fiscal year 2021 and have seen a slow but steady ramp up in market share. In Europe, our sales continue to improve on the back of new market entry and improve market share in key markets. Based on Equivia data, Ogivri continues to be a leading biosimilar trastuzumab in Australia and Canada. While we have seen decent growth of 21% in FY21, there were certain business challenges that were amplified by COVID-19, restricting our ability to achieve our targets. Our partner Viatris is deploying various strategies to ensure the good growth of our commercialized products in the US and other developed countries. While COVID-19 presented some challenges in emerging markets, such as tender delays and reprioritization of budgets within healthcare systems, we continue to see strong demand for our biosimilars in these markets, resulting in good growth in our B2B and emerging market business for the year FY 2021. We have garnered a significant market share in many key markets, such as Algeria, Brazil, and Malaysia. Moving on to the R&D pipeline, we are pleased to announce that we have received European Commission's approval this month for our biosimilar bio Bevacizumab, developed in partnership with Viatris. This follows the approval of our biosimilar ASPART in Europe last quarter, giving us a robust portfolio of five approved biosimilars in Europe, along with an economic interest in two more approved in-licensed products. We are awaiting uh, feedback from the US FDA on the timing of the site biosimilar bevacizumab. We have noted that the US FDA has recently issued guidelines for virtual inspections for overseas facilities. And we are now working with the agency to see how soon we can effect this inspection. Um, and receive a, as we have already received a positive outcome from the US FDA on our BLA submission for both insulin as part and bevacizumab. Last year, we received WHO pre-qualification for our biosimilar trastuzumab, which covers 46 LMIC countries. Whilst we have recovered from the impact of the first wave of the pandemic, uncertainties with the second wave continue in the near term. So far, we have not seen any significant impact on our operations but we are closely tracking the evolving situation. The biosimilar market, whilst becoming increasingly competitive, continues to offer attractive opportunities for vertically integrated players like us. We expect to continue the momentum and improve market share for our current commercial products and expect to launch biosimilar bevacizumab and insulin as part in the developed markets in FY22. We also expect to make good progress in our robust R&D pipeline. We believe that we are well positioned to grow our biosimilars business globally on the back of our robust business fundamentals, scientific know-how, low cost manufacturing setup, early mover learnings, and a broad product portfolio. I would also uh, say that at this point, we are confident that FY22 is in a position to show higher growth 
than this is good. Lastly, let me come to research services or Sinjin. During the quarter, Sinjin reported revenues of 659 crores up 8% over Q4 FY20. PBT for the quarter stood at 24% versus 25% for FY20. For the full year, Sinjin reported revenues of 2,184, demonstrating growth of 9% against the corresponding uh, fiscal, uh, previous fiscal. PBT for the year stood at 20% versus 22% for FY 2020. Sinjin's Mangalore API manufacturing facility completed the qualification process during the quarter and is now a GMP certified unit. Sinjin continued to build on its integrated drug discovery and development portfolio during the year, including a five-year collaboration with 3DC, the drug discovery development subsidiary of Deerfield Management Company, and is proud of its partnership with Albiro Pharma to develop a drug that will help to treat specific genetic liver diseases, primarily in children. Sinjin also continued to support its clients on various research projects, including leukemia, Parkinson's disease, inflammatory disorders, fibrotic disorders, and orphan diseases. Based on Sinjin's strong fundamentals, sound business model, robust liquidity position, client base, and healthy fiscal risk profile, Crisil and Ikra upgraded Sinjin's credit rating during the year. In conclusion, I would say that these are challenging times, testing our resilience, intelligence, agility, adaptability, and other attributes that a business must display to stand out in a crowd. At Biocon, we are conscious that the pandemic is far from over, and it may continue to riddle us with new challenges at regular intervals. That said, we have spent the past year adapting to the new normal. We identified area, new areas that needed work and made amends. We worked hard over the past year to prepare ourselves to tide over past eventualities. Big or small, these eventualities were something we were very much focused on overcoming. Consequently, despite the headwinds, which resulted in some setbacks, we had a string of encouraging developments which laid a solid foundation for our future growth. We are confident of the long-term opportunities in every segment where we operate and our ability to deliver value to patients and customers and stakeholders the world over. In FY22, we expect to retain the growth momentum led by higher revenues in biosimilars, research services, and generics. We will continue to focus on the portfolio strengthening the development pipeline and fast track capacity enhancement. These initiatives will bolster our pursuit of enabling access to affordable therapies to patients worldwide and will have us positioned well to deliver on the expectations of our partners and stakeholders. With this, I would like to open it up to the floor for question and answers. Thank you, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will now start with the Q&A session. Just a reminder, please select raise, tab option, uh, raise hand option under the reactions tab of your uh, Zoom application. You will call out your name and unmute your line to let you ask the question. <clears throat> we request you to label your name on Zoom properly so that it is easy for us to identify. Also, while asking your question, please uh, begin, your name, uh, begin with your name and organization. You may want to limit your first set of questions and uh, come, up, uh, come back in the queue for the follow-up. We'll take the first question from Prakash Agrawal, Access Capital. Hi, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, my first question, Madam, is on the guidance. Is there a rethink on the guidance uh, that we were, uh, you know, uh, last quarter we said that we will review the guidance uh, for our biosimilar business? Is there a rethink there? You know, if you remember, Prakash, I had last uh, uh, quarter itself indicated that the $1 billion uh, target was unrealistic at this point in time, and that was already conveyed to you. In terms of guidance, I think we will need a few quarters before we uh, you know, uh, clearly indicate what we see as uh, the growth opportunity. But all I can say is that at this point in time, we have seen a growth of in the biosimilars business of 21% this fiscal 
I can confidently say it will be higher than that. That helps. And uh, secondly, ma'am, on uh, you know Q4 performance, you had a, a detailed opening remarks. Uh, but uh, while you mentioned that you know there has been a Q and Q decline in the biosimilar business, and also EBIT margin has come off. So. It is largely, uh, I mean, when we see that market share data is largely stable or marginally increasing. So do we uh, come to a conclusion that in the US or developed market, there has been a higher pricing erosion? Would that conclusion be correct? Well, certainly there has been a higher, uh, I mean, there has been some price uh, erosion, but I think uh, um, there has been a price erosion, but I think more than that, uh, I think we have had certain increased costs, which have, and as you can see, our R&D costs have also been very high uh, this quarter and this fiscal. So all that has contributed to this, and we do need to basically make sure that we focus on higher uh, revenue growth, and uh, you know, make sure that we get uh, greater contribution as a result of that to our EBITDA and EBITDA margins. Okay, got it. Great. Uh, I have more question. I'll join back the queue. Thank you and all the best. Uh, thank you, Prakash. The next question is uh, from the line of uh, Damayanti, HSBC. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. This is Damianti from HSBC. Uh, Ma'am, my first question is on some of the uh, in-market product in the US, uh, such as uh, Trastuzumab and Fulfilla. So, especially for Fulfilla, uh, our market share has been steady if we look at the market data. But uh, we have seen a really strong pickup from some of the competing biosimilars, which have entered uh, relatively uh, uh, recently. So, uh, uh, my question is like, uh, do we have scope to improve our uh, margins, uh, sorry, market share from here? And uh, what could be the factors uh, helping us to? Uh, achieve better market share in uh, in market products so i think beatrice is certainly looking at this uh, this opportunity to increase market share in the developed markets and i think they will focus on how they you know take on the competitive uh, in forces that they are seeing today so i am very confident that beatrice will focus on uh, garnering market share but that will likely lead, lead to some price erosion as well. So I think it's a really a question of how do you want to play the market, but I think Beatrice is very aggressive. Uh, thank you for your response. Ma my second question is on uh, Bevasujmab, uh, which we are hoping to uh, launch in the US in near term. So again, uh, that market, uh, when we look at the competitive scenario, right now, 65% market share is uh, taken up by two biosimilars, which have entered before us. So uh, with this kind of uh, you know market share going to the incumbents, do you believe uh, Biocon will be able to uh, make any, uh, I'll say, uh, significant uh, market share or sales uh, given the competition and pricing erosion in that particular segment? So, Damianti, uh, first and foremost, yes, it is most unfortunate that uh, COVID deny us, denied us entry into the U.S. market as we were expecting to get approval in December uh, 2020. But that said, I would think that uh, given the fact that we are extremely competitive in terms of uh, Bevacizumab, um, you know, Beatrice uh, and Biocon believe that they can still enter the market and quickly garner, uh, you know, good market share. It will take some time because it's always, uh, you know, it, it, it is always beneficial to early entrants. And it takes time for the follow-on uh, companies to take away market share. But we believe that the biosimilar opportunity is going to be a very large opportunity over the next few years. Um, and uh, given the competitive, uh, uh, you know, the market competition that we are seeing, we believe that we are in a good place. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I'll get back in the queue for more questions. Yeah, we have the next question from Neha, a JP Morgan. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for taking my question. Uh, Ma'am, uh, on the biologic business, the 14% revenue decline that we have seen, um, is it fair to assume that all of that decline is essentially due to price erosion in the US or are there any other moving parts in that? 
No, no, no. Generally, what happens is that, as you know, the uh, U.S. Uh, you know, Viatris's year ending is December, and we always see a slight decline in the fourth in the uh, in, in in the fourth quarter, because uh, what we uh, what we generally see is that uh, they do basically uh, you know cover their uh, requirements in the third quarter, and then we see a slight decline in the fourth quarter. Last. Uh, so we believe that although the third quarter had a, a higher, um, you know, uh, realization than the fourth quarter, we believe that uh, this is a natural uh, uh, trend that we are seeing every year. So we are not that concerned. But basically, what we believe is that we have lost significant opportunities because of our inability to launch, for instance, uh, bevacizumab in the U.S. market. that was a significant hit for us and there have been covid impact which has not allowed certain existing products to garner increased market share so we believe that uh, you know uh, you will see improvement uh, in 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 the coming quarters uh, um in that case ma'am uh, the em business wasn't impacted quarter on quarter that continued to show momentum that would be a fair uh, assumption Yes, the emerging market business did see a uh, 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 growth, and we expect it to be even greater in the coming quarters. Uh, and my second question is on the guidance that you mentioned that you know FY twenty two growth uh, is likely to be higher than the twenty one percent we've reported. Uh, one, does that assume a launch of uh, you know Beva in the US, biosimilar Beva in the US? And second, uh, you know, what would be the moving parts for that growth? Would it all be driven by developed markets? So, you know, you mentioned emerging markets. So, yeah. how much of it that growth is dependent on US and Europe? Whilst I can't share the breakup, all I can say is that we expect a contrib- very significant contribution from uh, emerging markets, and we expect a good contribution from the developed markets and from new products as well. so all of these are expected to contribute to good growth uh, in the coming fiscal and uh, to answer your question yes it is also riding on some uh, revenues coming from bevacizumab uh, thank you ma'am thank you uh, the next question is from shram srinivasan uh, j uh, goldman sachs yeah hi. Uh, thanks uh, for taking my question and thanks for the opportunity my first question is on the biosimilar uh, core ebitda margin right there has been a lot of variability and around r&d qoq so i'm kind of looking past that and looking at core ebitda margin i think the press release talks about 36% for fiscal 21 but i'm just curious about q4 what the core ebitda margins for uh, biofon biologics are and just trying to link it to the point around price erosion has there been a material qoq impact in that core ebitda margin? so perhaps i would like to turn this question over to my colleagues chinni uh, chinappa and uh, arun chandavarkar uh, hi good morning the core ebitda margins for the quarter is 33% but on a full year basis it's 36% i encourage you to look at a full year rather than the quarter the quarter has some moving parts but some one of items that uh, skew the numbers the full year average is a better indication of the year's performance so chini uh, is that pricing pressure has it led to that whatever 33 versus 36 or you think you know and when we look forward how should we look at that number uh, the 20 north of 21% of growth but what about margins for a beta margins yeah the, i think we we believe that the dip in q4 the sequential dip in q4 is a kind of a one off and it will i mean uh, really look at it on a full year performance that one off items have skewed uh, or brought the q4 down lower it's not structural the full year is a better uh, view of the performance uh, and to me sorry to just persist on this the severance pay does it come in that number there yeah. does it come yes so, you know, Can yes i, I think sorry uh, this n- numbers are just uh, revealed is excluding uh, severance pay and ex- excluding exception right sorry got it got it okay my second question uh, in general on um, you know the the 
the rest of the business, the generic business, uh, uh, again, pretty flat kind of growth for the year. But just, you know, is there an outlook? We are again starting to see uh, maybe at least some of the API numbers start picking up again for if I look at trade data, if I look at competitors. So just curious around the outlook for this business for fiscal 22. So, Sham, I think uh, Kiran already alluded to in our opening commentary that uh, we expect a double digit growth for formulations business in FY22. And uh, we expect a low single digit to flattish uh, growth in our API business uh, for two reasons. One, uh, we are also, as we're getting ready to launch our formulations in the US, a lot of the APIs uh, that we were early com earlier commercializing. Uh, would be used for a uh, formulation sales and second is as we create new capacities uh, we are currently running our uh, plans full so we do not uh, till we get uh, visac uh, commissioned and ready to commercialize till we get our hyderabad uh, facility where we are investing in a large synthetic facility uh, commissioned and ready to be commercialized we do not expect api business uh, to grow significantly. I think that this is uh, also in line with the guidance that we had given last year. If you recall, same time uh, for FI22, we had given a similar guidance that we expect API business to grow uh, mid single digit and our uh, formulations business to grow uh, mid teens to high teens. And that's exactly what happened in FI21. Uh, and we expect a similar trend in next uh, fiscal year. And again, as Kiran mentioned, we expect the growth uh, to start in generics business starting in FI23. Uh, that's when we expect more launches uh, in the US in our formulations business. Plus, we expect additional capacities to be uh, uh, commercially uh, ready to increase the sales in our API business. Yeah, thank you. This data point, 80-20, is that the same split of... Uh... API to formulations to that? That's right. Got it. And last accounting question, this 160 crore of gain uh, doesn't seem to be showing up on tax lines similarly. Is there some, is it not a, not a cash gain? I'm just trying to understand that. Thanks. Yeah, there's no tax uh, impact on that 160 crores. Uh, it is a one-time step up that we have taken uh, because of the change in the way Baikara was accounted. And... Uh, uh, that has been shown as a, uh, in, in the other income, but uh, for all practical purpose, it's uh, not the cash income uh, which is there. So, and, but there is no tax uh, associated with this uh, gain. Thank you. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Surya Patra, Philip Cap. Thanks for this opportunity. Uh, so just uh, on a clarification on the on the this Bayakara thing. Uh, so uh, we have reduced our uh, uh, exposure and hence there and hence uh, is it fair to believe this uh, R and D intensity will see some kind of moderation because of that and whether this quarter also a sequential reduction in the R and D is it because of that fact? That is correct, uh, Surya. So we uh, this will no longer be consolidated with our financials, but uh, it will be treated as uh, expenses or loss coming from associates. So there was uh, there were expenses of roughly 70 crores in R&D uh, for Baikara, uh, which has been, uh, which is not included in the R&D line. Okay. So anyway, it is not impacting as of now. Okay. No. So this uh, will be discontinued. I mean, as an associate, uh, obviously, the R&D expenses of uh, Baikara will no longer be directly impacting our uh, But maybe Siddharth, you might want to explain it. Yeah, so uh, uh, since uh, this is uh, uh, no longer a consolidated entity, or a, uh, <laughs> and Baikara is looking at doing fundraise in the coming fiscal, uh, wherein Biocon will be diluted further. Uh, we uh, have lost control on uh, the appointment of board of directors because uh, the way the fundraise happens in the US, there are certain rights that the incoming shareholders look at uh, and they don't want really the parent company uh, to control the, the board and hence we had to give up the board rights. So on a go forward basis, uh, our 
uh, obligations, our financial obligations are no, no more there for Baikara. We have already funded $40 million so far in Baikara to get Baikara to this stage. And all the future funding will be raised directly by Baikara uh, through, a various, uh, through a combination of various funding rounds. And since our obligations are restricted, the future loss that we will take uh, on account of Baikara will also be uh, restricted. Thank you, sir. Uh, my second question was on on, on the kind of uh, margin trajectory, sir, for the subsequent period. While the opportunity on the biosimilar side that really looks very strong, there is no change to the kind of uh, ultimate expectations and all. But obviously, last year was a kind of a abnormal year because of the COVID. Uh, uh, which impacted in multiple manner to our uh, biosimilar progression. So going ahead, uh, while that is still there, that is the impact of that is still visible. That is one. And uh, we have seen a static kind of situation in terms of the penetration of our product or market share of our product. So uh, possibly that could lead to a kind of a further price correction uh, from our side in terms of offering and uh, could impact the margin. And subsequently, uh, even on the various revenue stream front, whether it is on the Sinjin front or in the small molecule business front, there are enhanced activities that is on, which obviously possibly will start benefiting FI23 onwards. So what is the kind of uh, margin expansion or uh, uh, that, or what is the kind of margin scenario that one should expect in the subsequent period, or let's say in FI22, given all these challenge as well as the long-term opportunities? So Surya, I would uh, answer it slightly at a higher level. I would say that the core margin is something that you should look at rather than the reported margin because of R&D. Uh, being lumpy, as we have said in the past, uh, both generics as well as biosimilars businesses continue to invest in R&D and uh, uh, some of the activities we, I mean, whatever delays we saw in FI21, we expect activities to resume uh, in FI22, which can increase the R&D expenses. But from a core margins perspective, we do not see a directional shift in FI22 uh, at a group level. So, sure, if you just if I can just add one more, this ISP award for our new monopreneur, this MAP facility, is that is this is having any kind of meaningful implication for us to think about for our this opportunity? Yes, I believe uh, this is an important uh, recognition. Actually, this is a huge expansion for Biocon, and there are many many. Uh, opportunities. It's also being uh, ob obviously expanded for our own uh, growing pipeline of products, but it basically allows us to be, uh, you know, a scale where we can address large opportunities. So I do believe that this uh, plant is going to serve us well in terms of various growth opportunities going forward. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, we will take the next question from Samir Morgan Stanley. Samir, you are there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can. Okay, great. Thanks. And good morning, everyone. Um, again, quick question. You know, when we look at um, at a macro level, uh, biosimilars look like a great opportunity. Um, you know, it's it's not only DM, it's EMs. You have a whole basket of products. Uh, they're multi-billion dollar per product sort of uh, addressable market with just two to four, uh, two to four players uh, right now in the market. Uh, so it all looks good. Uh, but at the same time, when we look at micro level, that what is getting translated into your kitty, into your PNL, then the numbers are very small and they're just not going up. So just wanted to understand what's going to change this? Uh, what's going to take our market share up? You've got multiple products in multiple countries, but it's not showing up in our results. That's a good question, uh, Samir. I think the way I look at it is the following. 
I, let's uh, also accept the fact that uh, FY, I mean, uh, uh, calendar year 2020 was a very, very difficult year for everyone, especially us. Because you can see that we actually, uh, you know, were left out of the market for no fault of ours. I mean, if you look at the, uh, you know, inability for uh, plant ex inspections, uh, I can tell you that that was a really bad miss for us because we were really looking forward to the Bevacizumab approval. Everything went seamlessly till this last minute. Uh, we actually are well positioned to garner market share. And as you know, many of our timings of, in, of entry into many markets, especially the US, were also flawed. For instance, uh, I do know that uh, uh, Beatrice did miss out on a contracting cycle opportunity for Glargene in FY 2020, in uh, 2020. And so many, many misses have happened as a result of either timing or delays of approval, et cetera, et cetera. So I am very confident that when we get over these impediments and hurdles, we will have a very large spurt of growth. Uh, as far as emerging markets are concerned, we are actually uh, putting in all efforts to make sure that we are very significant players and we basically tap all these opportunities. As you know, we have had a management change and we are looking at all these opportunities in a very different way. And we expect that this will actually come back to the kind of growth trajectory levels that we were always pursuing. So I would say that uh, you will start seeing better uh, growth and improved performance uh, in FY22. And I think from FY23, you will really see a very strong uptick. That is my take on the opportunities, the performance, and our capabilities to garner market share globally. Okay, but great. Thanks. I think uh, this is a huge opportunity. There are few players. We have all that it takes to be very successful, and we want to deliver on that. Excellent. Thanks for this, Kiran. And the second question is, uh, you talked about uh, uh, in the previous call that there should be three more drugs, uh, biosimilar drugs, which should get into clinical trials uh, as we go forward. Um, any update timelines on that and what it can do to your R&D spend in fiscal 22? Yeah, so the fiscal 22 R&D spend is, of course, likely to uh, increase over fiscal 21. Uh, and uh, these are important programs because, as you know, if you know, it's it's a bit of a cat and uh, you know catch twenty two. If you don't invest in R and D, then you're not going to be able to uh, you know get growth through new products going forward. And if you invest in R and D, obviously, it does basically challenge your um, your your financials in 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 some way, but we believe that R and D is a very necessary investment for our kind of business. So we will continue to invest in R and D. You mentioned three molecules, and we are on track to get into the clinic. I think uh, there will be increased spends, but uh, we are obviously calibrating the spends based on uh, our business. Okay, one final uh, question from my side. Um, you know, looking at the FDA's guidelines for virtual inspection, uh, how executable or how um, onerous uh, do they look like? Uh, and and, and uh, uh, related to that is, how did UK uh, issue the marketing authorization for both Aspart and Beva? I mean, did they come down to inspection or how was that uh, made possible? Maybe I'll ask Shreyas Tambe to answer these questions. Thanks, Tamir. I think the, the guidance is pretty clear in terms of how they want to conduct uh, inspections remotely. And uh, we've actually had experience uh, with other agencies, including the, the EU, to have uh, done these inspections. And even in the other emerging markets, that they've actually moved over to remote inspections. The approval that you specifically asked about, uh, the, um, the European agencies have uh, leveraged even our previous inspections uh, while approving our Bevacizumab facility uh, in India and the uh, facility in, um, in uh, Malaysia as well. 
So we do have approvals for both uh, bevacizumab and aspirin, uh, one in India and one in Malaysia from the um, uh, European agency. Okay, any timelines issues that you can share for um, bevacizumab uh, a virtual audit by US FDA and the approvals that can come about? Yeah, so at this point, uh, you know, uh, Sami, we don't have specifics in terms of when they will uh, come over exactly or will they will conduct the remote inspection. Uh, but needless to say, uh, both Beatrice and us are working closely with them uh, to get, uh, get a sense of how quickly we can uh, get that accomplished. As we've said previously, uh, the agency has communicated to us that there are no uh, outstanding scientific questions uh, with regards to uh, bevacizumab. And, um, and we are looking forward to getting the uh, pre-approval inspection uh, accomplished so that we can get the product to patients as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. We'll take the next question from Bilint. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I had two questions. Uh, the first one was uh, on uh, insulin glargine. Uh, just wanted to understand that uh, uh, during a uh, couple of previous questions, uh, you've said that la it was unfortunate that we uh, sort of uh, timed, uh, the timing was not correct for Glargin, but now uh, getting into FY22, do you think that we will be able to sort of uh, uh, garner more share as uh, we go ahead? That was my first question. And my second question was uh, uh, for the biosimilar target, which we had put uh, of a uh, billion dollars, which we have said is as of now looks unrealistic. But I suppose that is uh, in terms of timing. And uh, so going forward, uh, do we see a very strong growth in biosimilars considering the uh, pipeline which we have and uh, the existing products uh, ramping up? These were my two questions. Thank you. So let me answer your first question. I think um, definitely we will get to the billion dollar target as soon as we are able to get back to a high growth trajectory. But as I said, we had given a, 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 an indication that it would happen by FY22, which is unrealistic. It won't happen by FY22. Um, and give us a little bit of time, as I said, to, to basically get back to a certain growth trajectory. Today, there are so many uncertainties. At least, uh, you know, the US and other uh, markets have opened up for business. So we hope that things will improve. That is our, uh, you know, anticipation. But as you know, now India is in a very bad way. So we have to make sure that uh, we continue to watch the situation. But uh, we hope that our international markets will perform well. Uh, now, uh, in terms of uh, uh, growth, as I indicated earlier in my comments, obviously we expect much stronger growth than this year. Uh, and we will basically keep you posted on how soon the billion dollar target can once again become visible. Um, as far as, uh, you know, Glargine sales are concerned, um, we have, uh, I will maybe ask Paul to comment on the Glargine sales, but we do expect that uh, FY22 should see an improved performance in Glargy. And, uh, you know, Viatris uh, will, uh, you know, will be able to, uh, you know, respond to many of these questions with far more granularity. But we believe that uh, our biosimilars business in uh, uh, the US should see a greater performance. Thanks, Karen. Uh, yeah, I'll just add a little bit. I think we've seen some uh, some pickup in share already uh, over the course of this year. And you know, as was stated, I think the the formulary cycle there's an annual calendar year oriented formulary cycle. So as we get into calendar 22, uh, there's an opportunity there uh, for for getting into the new cycle, and that's a process that's going on now, and that Beatrice is very much. Uh, engaged in, and we look forward to uh, to grow through that process. You know, Beatrice has noted the complexity in bringing this type of product to the market, and the expectation that there will be a long revenue stream for the slower ramp up that we're seeing because of these factors. Uh, but we do expect that growth as we go into uh, uh, the new formula year. All right. 
Thank you very much and all the best. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Vipul Chah. Yeah, Vipul, you are connected. Yeah, hello. We can hear you. Yeah, so I just wanted to know what was the uh, R&D spend for Baikara uh, during uh, FY21? Um, Siddharth, you might want to respond to that. My, ma'am, my yeah. second. Sorry. So the total amount of R and D for Baikara was around 180 crores. 180 crores. Yeah. And uh, sir, would you like to comment on the performance of uh, Malaysian plant for FY21 at EBITDA level? Was it EBITDA? Positive or a bit or negative, or and would you like to give any qualitative color on the performance of the Malaysian plant? Any? Yeah, yeah. Malaysia continued to operate at a loss in FI 21. We see a lot of improvement in FI 22, but really waiting for the glargine pick up in the US for it to turn into turn profitable and give us the desired ROI. But presently, it's still operating at a loss. Will it be possible to quantify the loss, sir? Yeah, yes, sir. Just give me a minute. Um, it is, um, I mean, uh, we have two parts to it. That is the, uh, yeah, at the PBT level, um, just give me, sorry, I'm at the PBT level, it was $33 million of uh, loss, but at EBITDA, we broke even at with a four, roughly $4 million gain. Okay. Thank you, sir, and all the best for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tushar, uh, you can go next. Just a clarification of the R&D spend, while there would be increased uh, spend on account of three products. We can't, hear we, we can't hear you, Tushar. Your voice is uh, distracting a bit. Am I audible? Yeah. yeah it is. Yes. Just from the R&D spend, while you know, the three molecules would increase the overall R&D spend, but at the same time, Bikara spend would not be there at a level. So, uh, you could just quantify uh, how much it would be for FI22? I can't hear you properly. Tushar, we didn't hear your question properly. Just on the R&D front, while there would be incremental spend on the three monitors, but at the same time, Bikara R&D spend is not going to be at the compulsory level. If you could quantify the overall R&D, two. Okay, so Tushar, let me probably try and answer the question. I still didn't hear you completely, but I think what you're asking is the R&D spend going up on three molecules and the Bikara R&D spend no longer being there. And if the question is regarding the guidance uh, on R&D uh, for next year, I think uh, in, in the ex engine we have mentioned that uh, we will be somewhere between 10 to 15% of revenue. And broadly, that guidance, uh, uh, give or take a few, uh, uh, one or two percent here, we maintain. I think in, in generic specifically, we incurred 8% of revenues in FY21. We are looking at spending 11% in FI22. And maybe Chini, if you want to give a specific number for biosimilars in terms of what was the spend as a percentage of revenue in FI21 and 22, I think you'll be able to calculate what should be the spend next year. Tushar, hi. Uh, the net R&D spend for uh, the biologics business was 10% of revenues in FI21. We see that trending upwards, but we're not giving guidance yet on the specific numbers because it's dependent on the progress of the molecules. We, we can't see Tushar, so probably he'll come back. I think you're ready to go to the next one. Yeah, we'll take the next question from Shirish. Uh, Shirish, please go ahead. 
Yeah, uh, good morning to all. I wanted to understand uh, the capex plan for the f- for the coming year, and also what has been the total capex for the foregone year. And my so- second question was pertaining to the increased cash in the books, uh, and we see the debt going significantly. Uh, you know, uh, in the northward directory, uh, there has been significant cash. Yet there has been, you know, a spurt of uh, increase in debt. So I wanted to understand uh, what has been on your mind. so maybe i'll answer the second question uh, first so we as you know last year we did couple of rounds of private equity fundraise in biocon biologics we raised almost uh, 1900 crores and a large part of that money was uh, used to repay the debt that was there between biocon and biocon uh, biologics uh, so the cash uh, that is uh, being held is uh, primarily lying with uh, biocon to fund the future investment Uh, so the net cash balance in uh, biocon as of march 21 is roughly 1500 crores and the debt that you see maybe chini can explain because large part of that debt actually is sitting in biocon balance some of the debt was raised in the early part of the year uh, when uh, before the private equity funds came in so the debt uh, uh, in uh, uh, biocon biologics has increased and towards the end of the year as we receive money from adq that money is sitting on the other side as cash and the goldman sachs is also treated as a debt right the fund is from goldman sachs yeah for accounting purposes the goldman sachs uh, investment is also treated as a debt called out separately chini you might also want to give the capex guidance for biosimilars then and ask indranil to give the capex guidance for generics For FI twenty one total net spend, net of partner funding was one twenty five million dollars. In FI twenty two, we expect a hundred million outflow on account of capex. Uh, so uh, for FI twenty one, our capex in generics was about two fifty crores. In the past, we have guided around uh, two thousand crores to be the capex over the next three years, uh, and at this stage, we continue to maintain that guide. thank you uh, we'll take the next question from charulata yeah i have uh, two questions how many andas uh, do we have pending approval in uh, small molecules so charulata at this stage we have 10 plus andas which are at various stages and uh, there are two andas where we had target action date in fi21 uh, where we have uh, no more pending queries with the fda uh, but uh, we got the crl on those two filings uh, because of want of a facility inspection by the fda but we ha- we are looking at multiple launches next year uh, we have three products uh, which are already approved uh, and will launched uh, in next year and we subject to the approval on two products which were to be approved in fi21 uh, we are hoping that fda is able to do a virtual inspection and we uh, can launch those those two products in next year but apart from the these four or five launches in next year we also have many other products uh, which have been filed and are under various stages of review but the launch date uh, for those products are beyond fi22 okay so so we can expect three three launches uh, in fi22 yeah as i mentioned that there could be uh, there i mean there are three new launches uh, in fi22 on already approved products uh, there are two products which are more vertically integrated products where we are expecting the fda to inspect the facilities and give the approval so you will have new launches in fi22 and that's what is going to drive that double digit growth that we guided for for uh, the formulations business of uh, uh, generics uh, vertical okay and uh, how much is the investment in the new map facility so if we really look as we as the numbers come out we've got about 250 million dollars Uh, that is uh, sitting in C web. A substantial part of that is for the two large map facilities that are coming on stream. One which is 
just got the award and there is another single use by reactor plant that is also under the uh, construction or under qualification really really okay and uh my uh, third question pertains to the WHO pre-qualification. Do you expect, uh, I mean, how much business do you expect to generate from that? So let me uh, respond to that uh, question. I think the WHO pre-qualification is a, is a very important step because there are several countries which look forward to this guidance, uh, you know, to move forward with the um, commercialization of the product in those geographies. Uh, at this point, we wouldn't like to give specific guidance in terms of revenues from each of these markets, but needless to say, it is uh, in line with our uh, mission to see that we can, uh, you know, get product accessible to as many geographies as possible. So it's a part of that mission. Okay. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take the next question from Harith, Spark Capital. Hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, on on Baikara, what, what is our stake now? Uh, have we uh, lowered it from the 100% we used to hold earlier? And, and the increase in uh, share of losses from associates and JVs uh, to around 70 crores this quarter, uh, is it uh, coming on account of Baikara? And, and will this be a recurring number? Hey, Indranil, you want to answer that? Yes. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so, so subsequent to the stake diet, uh, subsequent to losing control, our current stake in Baikar is at about 87%. The current quarter spend of uh, 70 crores, uh, we, I think in one of our earlier comments, we mentioned that in the next year, we expect to pick up losses up to 200 crores, uh, which will be limited to the extent of carrying value of investment in the associate. So, uh, 200 crores for FI22 will be the uh, uh, share of losses from uh, by Cara. That's right. And then, uh, can you confirm the uh, gross and net debt consolidated level? So, the gross debt at a consolidated level is about uh, 4,500 crores and net debt is around uh, 700 crores. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Nitya. Please go ahead, Nitya. Hi. Uh, quick one. Uh, do you can you give us an update on the interchangeability status for insulin glargine at the US FDA? So we've, uh, as we've said before, we are uh, in uh, in conversation with the agency and. Uh, 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 this, as we have said before, is uh, is a first uh, for you know, of its kind for the agency. We have uh, you know uh, been receiving encouraging feedback. Uh, clearly, conversations have um, uh, progressed to a point, and we believe that um, you know under the 351k pathway, we will have a, a opportunity to move this forward. Uh, but at this stage, uh, the agency isn't in a position to give us a firm um, guidance on where they stand on this. Uh, although we remain optimistic on uh, on that progress. Uh, sorry, just to follow up, do you have a TAD date and do you have any updates on whether this would require a pre-approval inspection? So they haven't specifically guided us on a pre-approval inspection at this point, but uh, you know we are watching how this progresses. As you know, we already have the approval and we have the comparability for this. So we're not... Um, not really looking at a, a physical facility, uh, you know, inspection at this stage. Uh, is there a TAD date? Do you have a date on which you're expecting to hear back? There has been uh, in general guidance on, on where the agency uh, would like this to be. But at this stage, given the pandemic situation, I think a lot of this has been fluid, Nitya, in the recent past. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, gentlemen, this was uh, the last question. We thank you again for joining us today. If you have any additional questions, you can reach out to us anytime. Uh, we, we wish you good health and look forward to seeing you again next quarter. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.